Oops. Yeah, right. Okay. So I already submitted my code review, but uh, well, I, I hope it gets <laughs> accepted soon. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to talk about evaluation today and the uh, learning objective. We're going to start like mm, with the evaluation basics. Then we're going to learn like two new concepts, quotures and data mask. And we're going to try to understand tidy evaluation. Uh, and we're using these two passages. So uh, first, a bit of a recap. We've been talking about metaprogramming, and that's uh, like the objective of metaprogramming. It's to separate uh, the description of the action from the action itself. We have to separate the code from the evaluation. And last week, we talked about quasi quotation, and that was like trying to combine the code written by the function's author with the code written by the function's user. I think like that distinction, it's important and it's gonna be important throughout this, this chapter where when were the, the, the writers of a function and when we are the, the users of a function. Mm, so on quotation, it gives the user the ability to evaluate some parts of a quoted argument and evaluation, it gives the developer to the ability to evaluate quoted expressions in custom environments. And most of the time, we're going to be the, the, the developer, so that's why we, we, we have to uh, understand evaluation. And the three important as aspects of study evaluation are the quasi quotations, the quotients, and the data masks. So first, um, we already seen this this function. We have, we've already used it. Eval. We said that uh, we use eval to run to to evaluate, run or or execute an expression. And eval requires two arguments. One, it's the expression, and two is the environment in which to evaluate the expression. So it's like where, what are the values for the objects being used in the expression? That's where, where uh, eval is gonna look for those values. And the default is the, the current environment. So if we have an expression that is just um, the addition of, of two variables, if we have those variables uh, in our current environment, it's just gonna evaluate the expression. But if we wanna change the, values of those objects, we can send an environment, we can create an, a new environment using env when we, where we declare our, our variable, where, where we assign uh, our, our object and then use that environment for, for eval. So it's the same expression, just different environment. And one of the applications that it's uh, that it's discussed in the in the object in the book it's um, reimplementing so source. If we like, we all know that source will take a file and just like evaluate everything together. So what will we we need? We, we will need to read the file being sourced. We will need to par parse its expressions. And and here I I, I had a question. I mean, Parse is the same as quoting, right? Like we can use parse or like as an yeah as, as a verb. Um, is it? Can can I just say that instead of parse like, expressions? I feel that parsing is a little bit more like turning text into an expression. Okay. Um, as and, a like, like a text string into mm -hmm. an expression, yeah. which I think yeah. is slightly different. Okay. But it does quote them as well, I think. Right. Yeah, I, I'm that like, and you see that like you provide a pass and a read line on the past, so it's it's used to uh, evaluate file more, I think. But you can there is an argument, so you can change that. I think if I remember correctly in past, but the default argument, I mean the default version of past, uh, past sorry is is considered. I think it's it's for file, and um. I think you can change that. I, I remember reading the book on it, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was asking more in the like yeah, it, it, as as a as a verb if it was the same. 
but okay you know, yeah in, i think they are this, they are very close yes okay now in, in this case we're gonna we're gonna parse all of the expressions in the in the file then we're gonna evaluate each of the expressions and return the, the results so like here we're reading the the file each of its lines we're parsing each of the each of the expressions in the in the file and then uh we are we are actually evaluating each of the, of the expressions so as a small um, example um like I I'm gonna have this um, this file and source it. Like if if right now it it only has one function uh that multiplies the the arguments and then zooms uh and uh, yes it, it it just take another variable to zoom it. If I hit source, well it's gonna um, get an error because I don't have any of these objects. But if I um if I assign my object and E will be uh 10, I'm just gonna I'm gonna expect uh 15 as the final result. So it sources and we get 15. And with source two, I have my source function here uh, and I'm just going to pass the path that is in my but I need to um because we 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 um, we return the results with invisible I actually have to catch them. Ah, uh, no, sorry. So it's it's the same. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of like an application for Eva. Okay. Now we move to quotients. So as we said, for eval, we need an expression and an environment. And there is no data structure that has them both. So uh, a quotient is actually that. It's a data structure from our lang that contains both an expression and an environment. Uh, the name comes from quoting and closure because it quotes the expression and it closes the environment. So we have three ways to create a closure. Quotures. Uh, the, the function new closure, it's mostly for learning. Uh, it creates the object from from its component. Thank you. So we call new closure with an expression and an environment, and we can use uh, about tidy again from from the Erlang package um, like directly. So in this case, the expression only assumes these two these two uh, arguments, and we have the result. Arlang also has functions to get the components of a, of a quotient, uh, get expression or get environment. And we can see here the expression that we sent and the, the environment. And we, we can also use uh, functions from Arlang set env and set expression if we wanna if we wanna alter some of the components from the quotient. So in this case, I have the same expression as before but a new environment when I'm where, where I'm changing the uh, the values for the for the variables. So it, it only changes the, the environment and the, uh, here we have the result from the eval tidy. But this is not a function that is actually used in kind of the real world world uh, in the real developer world. Actually, we're gonna have to use mquo or mquos to capture user supply expressions. And 
because of end quote and end quotes, we're not like explicitly declaring the environment like we like uh like right here with new closure. The these functions are gonna take the environment from from when they are created. Diana, can I ask you a question? Yes. What what's the point of new closure? Like that that function in Arling? Like why would we want to do this? Uh like like the book said a new closure will be for 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 learning. I think also for testing too. If you're writing a function and you want to see how it reacts with a different environment and things like that, I could totally see using that in tests. But mm -hmm. I agree. I don't think you really use it outside of like exploration, maybe. Okay. Great. Thank you. It's it's also like maybe like as by at the beginning, Diana Eric said it well, like Air does not have a native data type to to do that. There's no data type closure. It's a combination of two IDs. And mm -hmm. so I guess it's also like a teaching um tools yeah to project but yeah great thank you and and yeah like right here we're we're still like in the developer um mode we're gonna yeah we're gonna evaluate expressions as as developers and and that's why why we need the closure to match an expression with an environment uh so yeah uh, as developer we're we're mostly gonna use end quote and end quotes and for, like right here um, we like i'm creating an expression that again it's just uh the addition of of two variables and uh using the end quote function and again, we can use some some Arlang functions to get the expression and get the the environment. And because this closure was created in the global environment, we have that as the as the as the environment for my closure. Although I, I, we didn't uh, we didn't set it explicitly. And there are another set of functions quote and quotes and the book says that they're almost never used and they're kind of uh they were created like for completeness completeness to match uh expression and expressions okay so we must remember that quotes are just a convenience i mean they're only to match the expression with the environment but they are really good to work with dot 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 because then we can use a different environment for each expression in the dot 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 uh, argument so right here we are creating quotes using an expression that's called uh, g and we're going to create like multiple quotes from uh, whatever comes in the in the dot 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 argument and right here, I'm I'm creating another function that it's gonna use that G function to create an expression. Th this expression is gonna be actually just a symbol, a next symbol from my function environment. And I'm gonna use this function to create another symbol but this time from my global environment. So I have one X from global and one X from inside the function. So when I create those two closures using my, my create quotes uh, function that calls my G function that calls end quotes, I end up with these two closures. One from the global environment, and one from the from the function environment. And I'm sorry, but I, I actually didn't evaluate this. Uh, okay, let's do it. Let's do it right here. Um, okay, so we have the G function and the create quotes.
and I'm creating these two quotures. And if we want to evaluate them, because U is a, it's a list uh, of two things, we can call eval on the first uh, element of US. That will be my X from global and then from the second argument that will be my expression from the function. Fun yes. yes. But okay. I, I'm not a huge expert on that but can you move like in the global environment? pen in the environment can you ask for it also do they have included that like you have like on the top right panel environment uh -huh. when it lists your object can it look also like the function environment because i see like a little drop down button on the top uh, no uh, on that's fine no no big deal i will check that later thank you <laughs> but wait this is not a evaluating like what yeah i was wondering about wonder what happens if you it, run eval eval on it <laughs> i i think it's not evaluating it's written like the list or the object it prints basically i mean it kind of yes. prints okay but uh what is this qs11 I mean, yeah, that's what I think will work, but um, I'm not sure why. Oh, no, it doesn't either. Yeah, because you are evolving the evolve. You can look a bit more into the data list, QS, or STR oh, not... QS. Wait, is it eval? Yeah, here. It so... is eval. I have, yeah. Like, wait. You have to unquote, unquote it? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I had, I had it. Uh... No worries. Um, it's difficult, by the way. Like, uh, and it's, and you, I think you are ma mapping it in your head very fast and very quickly, so it's good. <laughs> Let's Oh, it's not a ball, it's about tidying. Sorry, because we're using a quote. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> and you don't need right. the yeah, second ever. I was getting all like, wait, what? <laughs> it was supposed to work. Uh, yeah, if we, if we use a ball tidy this time, uh, it, it works and we have the my first uh, quotient comes from the function environment. So uh, it has the, the value of one and the second one has the, the value of zero from the global environment. So that's kind of a, a, a nice thing uh, about using quotient. We can set an environment for uh, different, um, for different, for different uh, expressions in the dot, dot, dot. And I mean, in this case, we can we can use also for um, map map double because that's the the results uh, to use to evaluate both both functions with uh, eval tidy. Sorry, can you tell me the difference between eval and eval underscore tidy? You don't need map two, just regular map. Oh yeah, sorry. Sorry to interrupt, Joe. That's no, right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. What's the difference between eval and eval tidy? So with eval, we're gonna, we will have to use, we're, we will have to send the expression and the environment like here, expression and environment. Yeah. And with eval tidy, we use a quotient. The quotient already has the expression and the environment. So it's kind of a wrapper for the things that eval needs mm -hmm. 
but a valve is not uh is not able to use a quotient for the evaluation. Just a valve tied in. Uh, it's, it's got it. it. Got it. Okay. If you, you if you type of if you type of Q one or QS, I mean I think it's a closure type, no. And if you try like the other one, you will get language syntax or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, closure, but type of maybe or class. Oh, we're we're gonna we're gonna see that. Uh, oh, okay. So yeah, sorry. It's a it's a <laughs> formula object. I guess we can like we could use eval with the elements of the of the closure if we will get expression from my QS1 and get environment from the closure. Like that should work, yes. But we're getting the different parts of the closure, the expression and the evaluate and the environment to send it to, to evil. Mm. Okay. Uh, some other facts about about quotients. Mm, actually, formulas were the inf inspiration for for quotient because they also capture the expression and the, the environment. If we uh, print a formula, it will say the class is formula and it has an associated environment. And the book said that there was a, an early version of tidy evaluation using formulas, but it was really hard to implement quasi quotation. So they they ended up uh, not using formulas. And quotients are actually called objects. If we use class, we're gonna see that they are a quotient and a formula. But if we use is call, uh, it's gonna return true. And I mean, it's a call object with an attribute to store the, the environment. Like that, that's kind of like under under the hook. And we can also use nested nested closures. Mm, we can embed embedded closures in expressions. So right here, uh, we are declaring one closure and another one closure, just like with with a symbol uh, of x equals one and x equals one one hundred. And if we want to use these closures inside an expression, we will have to unquote it using uh, the bang bang. And then we can use eval tidy to evaluate that new created expression from the unquotation of the closures. Yeah, those those words are really bad. But uh, and for for printing, the book said that uh, it's better to use expression print because you're you're gonna uh, we can see it right here. Um, uh, we will create a nested closure with the evaluation of. One was the evaluation of U three, and if we print it, uh, the book says it actually kind of retains the the formulas, um, like the format of of a for, of a for formula, but uh, if we if we use our our lines, uh, about print, no, X. It prints them in different colors, saying that each one of the elements of this expression comes from a different environment. So the quotient's environment. Mm. And now that we learn about closures, we're gonna learn about data masks. So the, the data mask or data mask, uh, it's a data frame where the evaluated code will look for its variable definitions. So instead of looking 
into the environment for the values of the, the variable that are being used in the expression, it's gonna look into this data frame. And, and we have to supply this uh, data mask as a second argument uh, to a vault ID. So in this example, we're creating a quotient with an expression that is gonna multiply two variables and we're setting only one of these variables in the uh, environment. So we're saying that X equals 100, but we're not, not saying anything about uh, Y in the environment. But we're creating a new data frame that has one column name as the na name uh, equals as, as, the, as the variable that we're using in, in the expression. So a valid ID, if we send this, this data frame as the second argument, it's gonna look for the values of the of the variables there. So a valid ID in this case for the multiplication is gonna get the X value from the expression and the Y value from the the, the data frame. And in this case, we were using a new quotient, but as we said before, the the use of end quote is is like it's um it's that's the 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 actual function that that developers use. So we can have the same thing, but uh, everything together in in one function. So we will have the expression. That will be the imported expression from this with to two function, and we are also gonna have the the data frame for the about ID. But because I'm using the same data frame as the, as in the first example, right here with enquo and about ID. A vault ID is gonna know that it has to look for the uh, Y in the data frame because the Y exists there, but the X doesn't exist because I didn't provide it as a as like as an as a as a variable in the environment like we did with the new quotient. So we're gonna have to declare it first. So it's the same. If you hadn't declared. If you hadn't declared that that x gets a hundred, then when you went to do with two, it wouldn't. It would just give you an error. Yes, yeah, it will. It will give you an error because it it doesn't have the, that value uh, for the evaluation. Or you could also add it as another column in the in the data frame for the data mask, and then it will it will actually know where to where to look for that. And the book said that, that this is also doable with eval instead of uh, eval tidy, but in this case we we will have to use substitute as we we learned uh, the last last week uh, instead of enquo, as we we use it uh, instead of an expression. The the function call doesn't change that much. We're still uh, sending the expression, the data frame, but eval requires uh to require us to specify the the environment because it, it doesn't have it from because there is no quotient but uh it will still work but this actually this this actually creates an ambiguity problem because now our about id function can have values from an environment and from a data frame. So we have to use these two pronouns to specify where do we wanna look for, for these values. So if we have a quotient that we'll use again, uh, like a, a, a simple expression, and we have our environment with the X, and we also have an X value in our data frame. Actually, the values from the data frame take take precedence. So it will uh, about ID will use the values 
from the datamas and my my x from the m will never be used but if i wanted to actually use the x from the environment like us as as developers will have to say okay you have to look for the x value in the environment for the for the addition but you have to use the x value from from the uh, data mask for the multiplication so so yeah like in this case it works because now we're 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 specifying uh we're, we're using the pronouns to specify which values we want to use and one of the one of the applications that it's that is discussed in the in the in the book is the re-implementation of of subset subset is a subset works like filter it but it's a function from 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 base so what well, what subset does is that it selects rows uh, of a data frame given an, an expression. So in this case, we will, like what will we, we need to, if we wanted to re-implement subset, we will need to quote the expression that we were gonna use uh, for, to filter. Then we have to evaluate that expression to figure out which rows in the data frame pass the filter. And we actually like finally we'll have to actually subset subset the data frame. So this is the like the new implementation uh for subset. We are in quoting rows will be our our mm, expression to filter the data frame. We have to unquote it, meaning we are creating the quoter. Then we have to make the, the evaluation actually run the uh, evaluation using our data frame mm, right here it's only a um, uh, like a check that that this this evaluation returns a logical a logical vector and then we have to actually do the sub the subset so if we have a sample data frame we can use this subset to to get the rows where B is equals to C. It's it's the same as a as a filter. And in this case, it will be our shorthand for sample DS, DF, then subset sample DF, get the, the variable B equals to sample DF, get the variable C, and, and that's it. Mm, okay, so that will be kind of a, an application to use quotures and about ID and data mass as if we were the developers. But the book says that that's actually not going to be the case. Mm, like that, that's not going to be the common case. Instead, we will ha have to kind of become users and developers because we will be we will not be calling about ID directly. It will be more uh more common that we use a function that is gonna call about ID. So in this case the example that that the that the book gives is we will like to have a sample and a subset, a function that does the resample and uh, subsets at the same time. So we have this resample function. I'm just gonna run everything so that we can see how it works. Mm, I'm gonna take my sample data frame from here. So that's our sample data frame. And let's say that we already have this resample function. And we're gonna use that resample to resample or resample the mm. 
In this case, we're, we're gonna ask for a new data frame with 10 rows. And we also want to use our subset function because our final our final use case will be having resample with subset. Uh, in this case, we are using resample. Um, no, sorry, subset. With subset two or newly created uh, subset with frame, and we wanted the only the the rows that were B was equal to C. Okay, so our first attempt will be to create a new function that will, the the name will be a subsample that it's gonna use these two functions that we already have. Uh, oh, uh, Joe asked the row number in, mm, in the data frame? No. In your, in your code editors, you are using like... Um... Oh Remember? yeah, I, yes. That's I used, fine. That's good. No. Yeah, I, uh, yes. A, a, a beam, the beam wrapper that that R Studio has to get the the reference, and yeah, I use like yeah. To, I don't understand it. What does forty seven mean? And then there's all these ones everywhere. Like, okay, so forty seven is the actual number of the line. Okay, and then you have the number like that up and down because we with bi and, and with beam you can move around if i do if i do 10 uh j i will go 10 lines down or 20k i will go 20 lines up uh but that's from the from the from okay, the sir. I, yes, that's from the VI um, editor, and our mm. studio has a rubber for 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 the for that. That that's funny because I use Vim uh, also in our studio, and I do not have that, so I don't know. <laughs> but what does it mean? One? Why is it thirty-seven and then one? What does the one refer to? The first line down my thirty-seven line number. So this one will be thirty-eight and thirty-nine, but yeah. it's I think it's always. Ref I think it's always relative to where the cursor is. Right there. Yeah. The cursor oh. shows you the actual line, and then so the if you just arrow down, line. will it say thirty-eight? Just arrow yes. down one. Yeah. Oh. And then it, it tells becomes you jump. relative to the place. If you're like, I understand. Oh, go I ten rows above, then you know what row to go to without having to do the math. Yes. Yes. So it took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> I got it. I got it. If we want to jump like right here. All the way to this row that I don't know which number it is. Like I just do. Uh, I don't know. J J sixteen. Okay. And yeah. yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the smaller <laughs> <laughs> distraction. Uh, yeah. So okay. So we already had the subset two function and the resample function. And we're like our first attempt will be to combine them to have a new subsample function. So we create that function and we call it with uh, our sample df. The condition, I'm gonna use the same condition, b equals c. And again, I'm gonna ask for 10 rows. But this give me an error because what is happening here is that the condition this b equals equals c is being evaluated like inside the subsample function right when I call it. Although we're Although we're already encoding it in the subset two, we're not doing anything in the subsample function. So the subsample function doesn't know what B and C are. 
So as developers of the subsample function and users of the subset to and the resample function, we have to do something here. We have to try again. And, and quote the condition here. And let's say but then when we when we're calling subset two we will have to onboard it. Then I, did I do did I, did I do it right? Yes. <laughs> You unquote. Yeah. So this time, if we try uh, again, we're going to subsample this new data frame after, sorry, we're going to resample this uh, new data fr frame after the sub subset two. The subset two, uh, yeah, the filter. So in this case, we became both users and uh, developers. We're users of a function that that uses a vault ID. So we have to be careful with our quotings and unquotings. And what the what the book said that that we uh, is that we also need to be careful with that ambiguity, because if we will used again this subset to function uh kind of a, as a threshold as a function to set up a, a threshold in a in a data frame and we're just gonna filter this data frame and we're gonna get the we're gonna try to get the the rows where x is greater than a value provided by, by by the user of this function. This could have some uh, unwanted effects. Like what will happen if X exists in the calling environment, but it doesn't exist, it, it actually doesn't exist in the data frame. Or if value also exists in both the environment and the, the, the data frame. And like as developers of the threshold X function, we are not, we're, we're not uh, taking care of that potential ambiguity. So because the subset two, it's already defined, we cannot do anything to, to that function. We are the users of subset two, but the developers of this, this threshold. So in this case, we can use the pronouns to say that the X that we're gonna filter, it's gonna, the value uh, of, of X, it's gonna, like the, the subset two function, we're gonna have to look in the data frame for this value, but the val is gonna come from the from the environment. And the, the book also said that there will be some time where the ambiguity, like as developers, we 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 wouldn't be able to like um, take all of the, the potential ambiguity uh errors so as a general rule of thumb as function authors it is our responsibility to avoid ambiguity with any expression that we create and as users it's the responsibility of of the user to avoid ambiguity in the in the expression that that, that they create i mean the problem is we're, we're, when we are both users and developers so we actually have to take care of all of the potential ambiguities but yeah mm. and the final part it was the, the base the base evaluation and i didn't put it here but it was one 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 example that was uh similar to to what uh steffi steffi discussed uh as the last example for for the for the for the for last um yeah for for quotation and it was it was also about uh about linear models but 
I thought like because the tidy evaluation was kind of the the new concept, it was it was uh, better to to discuss it. So yeah. yeah, was great. Like I think you navigate that like perfectly. Like it's super hard and. Uh... And since, like, I think you have it way clearer than I. So, congratulations. <laughs> I'm glad uh, you're doing it. Um, you yeah, know, uh, at one time, I was like kind of wondering is we kind of, if what's the goal, the, the like the high level goal seems sometimes very similar to oriented objects. You know, like you want to interact with an object in some way but you want to generalize on it in another way. Like the, you know, like you are like creating these abstraction layers of environment instead of working with an object. But the goal seems like very similar in some way, but the way you achieve it is different. And I don't know exactly which the boundary of which tool is the best in some cases. So I was like, I, I, and I have no answer of that question, but I was just like noticing, hey, at one time, like with the data mask, we want to have a data object, then we want to interact on that object in a very specific way. But like you could have solved that with an object oriented programming, but instead you are doing it with like this uh, nice uh, environment definition. But I'm not smart enough to know which is better. <laughs> I, I have a question though that and I think it, uh the I, I don't remember who, his name he he also he asked something about that uh, last week about the double oh when, we, we, when will we use this instead of the bam bang oh my gosh that was exactly my question uh, was that like I have things with me are really really busy right now at work and stuff and so I haven't been putting in the effort the you know the pre-work time to our book club but I was exactly just typing in the chat like I thought what this chapter was going to be was was about teaching me how to use this I and I don't feel newer. like I've learned how to use that I but think this is newer where? The double curly braces and and not like you put it correctly in the chat. It's space space. Oh, space space space. Yeah, it no, it's curly braces, curly braces, space variable space. I it's did. Not the same that the other one, like the. You, just, you guys aren't talking about glue. Syntax, it's not only you? on glue, no. And this no, is different. This isn't about I'm glue. Typing. It's about like. If I want to, um, if I want to be able to put in, you know, empty cars, and I and I want to put in my function weight, right, and then I, my function is doing some filtering and mutating and whatever, but I want to the the argument to this function I'm creating is is the variable name. Oh, that's interesting. Sorry, I think this is new to me. Uh, my guess is that this is too new for the book. Yeah, it's too new for the book. You're correct. Wait, wait, Olivia, you think that's how it's written without the spaces? I, I no, I think it's different. Like if you look with the spaces. Spacing, yeah. So if you look at the, I'm looking at the DeepLayer tidy here. I'll put it in the, the programming yeah. chapter from DeepLayer, and they use spaces. I but think I, it probably doesn't spaces. matter. I think it's just. Oh, know. it does uh, matter. I think it matters. Yes. Uh, you I don't... think um you think I know this actually. I think this is like a short form for um you know how. When we were doing this, uh, the subsample example there, you have to unquote condition and then um, unquote it. You you unquote it and then you unquote it with the bang bang. Mm -hmm. And then the curly bracket, curly bracket um, is both at once. So you don't have to unquote it and then bang bang it. So do you want to try that? Do you want to get rid of the, do you want to try the subsample uh, fu function there and just put curly bracket, curly bracket around new condition? Right, I did use this. It's all coming back to me now. It's just been a while. So uh, that will be. Yeah. So I wouldn't need to create the. Uh, yeah, it would just be condition and bang bang. Oh, sorry, curly bracket, curly bracket, and then you can comment and that so one. So without out. spacing, just let's write a. And I don't think the spacing matters. Like in okay. R, it's always a matter of style, unless you're changing. The so operator. Okay, so I I wouldn't need to unquote it and then unquote it, so I will yeah. be able to just say send that. So, yeah. Yep. So it's kind of just like a shorthand because if you're if this is all you're doing, if you're mo mostly just working with tidy, tidyverse functions, it it gets tiring, right? To like just 
oh, I got to quote it and unquote it and quote it and unquote it and quote it and unquote it. And were you just using the, the curly brackets just as a shorthand? So the curly bracket is a, a function, the double curly bracket, the function that's uh, unquoted and then bang bang is um, is also unquoting. No, no, first, because like first we unquote you quote it. it and then you unquote it. Yeah, then, okay, yeah. we unquote it. Then. Or like, as I think of it, like you quote it and then you like send the unquoted one on. Okay. <laughs> That's how I always think about it. Cause it, so maybe it's not a function. Software, That's a good point. Yeah. Maybe it's it's doing at another level. And they call so, it embracing. <laughs> and so is that how I get like a variable name into like a tidy pipeline? Yes. Is that right? By yes. tidy pipeline, you mean pacing like with the Magritte pipe or? I mean, with the base pipe too, but I'm just saying like, if, okay, can you just write, can you write function, um, uh, you know, X or something? I remember someone's share, uh, uh, like an image about that in the chat, but I think it, it got lost, but like months ago. So you wanted to... Like there's an, a horrible example from the page I was just looking at. But that's that this is only using um like symbols, not not text, right? If you want to reference a column with with quotes, you'd want to use the dot data um preface or pronoun. Uh, I'm just I'm coming Then I'm cooking. Let her cook. Oh <laughs> it's hard to do that on the fly and sharing. Okay. Mute. Let's say that we have we want to mutate a, but we have it in a, in a variable. Yep. So if we uh, yeah, I, totally uh, works. Uh, okay, so we'll be mutable plus ten. In yeah. this case, we'll have to use I think in that case you need to use the dot data because it's a quote it's it's text it's not a symbol um so if you rep in this case instead of using the curly brackets if you did dot data square bracket square bracket you use the walrus operators also yeah. yep that's maybe it dot data dot, dot data data, data. Um, square bracket, square bracket. And mute, okay. And then, yeah, at the end there. Because that says, that's the dot data preface, and then you're giving it mute call, which is quote A, which works like um, you would think of pulling out the name of a list item or something like that. Yeah, but like the the double square bracket, like work always, like work, work always with a variant variable, no? Oh, no, because it's A. You... It's yeah. not a symbol, right? If it was yeah. a symbol, so if it was A, without or not even um don't, you don't have to use sim just just give it uh actually you do have to get use sim don't you yeah you absolutely never mind now the curly bracket curly bracket i think it should work okay that this this wouldn't would okay this will still work but uh so it will be Okay. Yep. And if we would like to use that mute call as right here, then you need to use um again the colon. And the uh, this one, right? I'm well. Let's see. I'm not sure that'll work, but let's see how it goes. <laughs> it works. Oh wow! And because. Uh, I mean, it works. It's, it yeah, do what you expect, one, but like... With one, with this one, I just one. didn't know you could use the curly brackets on the left-hand side. That's pretty cool. That's dangerous. What does the colon do again? It says that the left-hand side is a symbol, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or um, yeah. not necessarily a symbol, but like an expression or something that needs to be evaluated. 
and it's uh, very well documented. And right here, we could actually use uh, the Ben Ben too. I think so too, yes. Yes, because if we're because we've already put a into being a symbol, and if we were doing this inside of a function, if we use the curly bracket, curly bracket, we wouldn't have to and sim the a first. Mm -hmm. We would just a curly bracket, function. curly bracket. Okay. Inside mm -hmm. of a deployer function, inside yeah, of a tiny logic function. Yeah, yeah, inside of a function. Yeah, yeah. Like um, like um, Joe's example in the chat there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's funny because I don't. I generally when I'm programming with tidyverse stuff, I don't. I use the tidy eval, but I don't make my functions use it. I usually just use text for column names. And so I'm much more familiar with the dot data, um, you know, open square, square thing. Uh, just because I'm really- I like it more too. Yeah. I think it I also like depends it. on, it, it, I got into this, and this is where I think about it a lot. Um, I was working with a client on a contract to work on um, kind of cleaning up their package and making it more user-friendly. And, you know, I, I, it's interesting. Like, I kind of feel like if you're doing functions where your columns may not exist in the data, then I feel like they should be in quotes is my thing. It's like, I feel like, or they should be text strings. If you're, if you're having a function with you manipulate someone's data, but you give them arguments to specify like what the columns are, like you say date is this name of the date column or something like that. And it doesn't like you're essentially telling the function what your date column is and what your other column is. But I don't know, for some reason, I feel like there should be in quotes because you're just like referencing names. You're not, anyway, I don't know. You're not really creating expressions that say, oh, manipulate these columns this way. You're just kind of informing the function about it. But I think it might be more philosophical than, <laughs> than anything. No, no, else. no. Like I will have like took like maybe break the function if I what I'm like you know try but maybe it's not always possible like to have a stop if not what you provide is not inside what you expect well the idea is we want to make it flexible so that the user yeah. doesn't have to have their input data be like essentially you can have a data cleaning function right that says oh here give me your data and I will make it into the appropriate data frame that can then be used by all the downstream functions and in that case you you don't want to just say oh it's not right you want to fix it for them so you need uh, anyway, I, that I is know. philosophical here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks everybody. See you next week. Bye. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye. Very good. Thanks. I'm gonna type in.